I want to thank uh, Matt for the opportunity to come and talk to you. Uh, I am kind of replacing Dr. Odekoven, which is a poor replacement for the job he'd do on this, but I'll do my best. i um, going to talk to you a little bit about what South Dakota experienced in 2013 with Winter Storm Atlas. Since South Dakota is kind of a flyover state, I thought maybe I'd uh, bring to you the map to show where we're at. We're right there between Wyoming, North Dakota, and Nebraska. Uh, Atlas affected mostly western South Dakota, and South Dakota is divided by the Missouri River. I don't have a pointer here, but um, the Missouri River cuts the state pretty much in half and uh, divides west and east, definitely a different culture and different uh, uh, terrain on both sides of the river. Um, this is uh, actually a satellite picture of, of South Dakota a couple days before the storm. You can see the Black Hills labeled there on the uh, Wyoming-South Dakota border with just a little bit of snow, but uh, no other snowpack in the area. So this is typical western South Dakota, wide open spaces, lots of grass. Uh, there's 14 counties west of the river in South Dakota, and most of them look like this. Good, good uh, grazing for cattle and sheep. The average uh, ranch size out there, the, statistically, they say it's about 1,500 acres. Uh, I've been all over western South Dakota, and I know how big those ranches are. I think that way undershoots what average is. Um, but it doesn't look like there's much out there except grass. If you get to looking a little bit closer, you see there is a little bit more. There are several rivers that uh, cross western South Dakota and dump into the Missouri. These rivers uh, provide some shelter, provide some uh, uh, some place for the livestock to get out of the wind, get out of the rain, things like that. A lot of canyons, hills, they'll get it back on the backside, get out of the wind. Um, typically, if there is a storm or something like that, that's where the livestock goes to uh, protect itself. Some more pictures of typical western South Dakota. Top right is the Black Hills, but uh, bottom right, kind of the grasslands, typically spring, really green and things like that. Uh, the top left picture was probably what it looked like in October of 2013 before the storm. We had a, a pretty good year as far as moisture in South Dakota that year. Uh, between July and September, we got between 5 and 10 inches of rain, which is just about unheard of for western South Dakota at that time of year. We're always on the edge of uh, a drought or being uh, two days from a desert out there, it seems like. So that was odd for us. Uh, because of that, the valleys were greening up. There was quite a bit of grass, uh, cool season grasses growing and things like that, and the grazing for the cattle was was uh, actually pretty good. A couple more pictures, western South Dakota. The top picture is the Badlands. The bottom picture is the Custer State Park Buffalo Roundup, which they do every year. Uh, that actually happened a week to the day before the storm in 2013. Custer and Custer State Park is in the hills. It was 65 degrees the day they did their roundup. Um, out on the prairies in western South Dakota, out of the hills, it was about 80. It's pretty, uh, pretty warm for October in South Dakota. So shortly after the roundup that weekend, the weather service, and they started putting out forecasts that we were going to have winter a little bit early, put us under a blizzard warning for most of western South Dakota, uh, predicted about... 25 inches of snow in Deadwood, which is up in the Black Hills, 12 inches in Rapid City, and then a, a band of 10 to 12 inches just uh, to the east of Rapid City, kind of where the, the uh, grasslands are and, and the main grazing areas are. And they were right for a change. Thursday, October 3rd, uh, it started with rain, and it, uh, it rained a lot, between three-quarters and two inches of rain during the day. Uh, temperatures dropped from 80 the week before down to the 30s, uh, low 40s, and the wind came along with it. 30-mile-an-hour, 40-mile-an-hour winds uh, sustained. Of course, with 30-degree uh, temperatures and uh, rain, you end up with snow. So they revised their forecast and told us that we'd probably be getting a little more snow, um, up to 24 inches out uh, into the plains and into the, to the western South Dakota prairies. And they were right again. 
Uh, snowfall range from 18 to 58 inches. 58 inches up in the Black Hills. Um, not unusual. We we have storms with uh, 18 to 58 inches of of snow. Probably not frequently, but occasionally. But one thing with this storm was the winds. Uh, sustained winds of 49 mile an hour, gusting to 60 to 70. See the Weather Channel there had uh, Ellsworth, South Dakota, which is where the Air Force Base is, just outside of Rapid City, 71 mile an hour, Rapid City at 68. Uh, temperatures continue to drop uh, down into the low 30s. Uh, wind chill dropped, of course, with that wind. Um, and then the visibility as the snow fell. Um, very, very limited vis visibility for a long time. Friday, Friday night, Saturday, it continued. And by Sunday, this is what the satellite picture of uh, South Dakota looked like. The worst part of the, the blizzard and the worst, the most snow on the prairie for, um, was right there, kind of where the word snow is, just a down and a little left of that. You kind of see it's really dense white there. That was probably the worst hit, kind of the center of the, of the storm. But, uh, certainly abundant amount of storm, uh, snow over a large, large area of South Dakota. So just for reference, there's the before, and there's the after. So what a storm does like that, when it hits, is it uh, pretty much paralyzes everybody and everything. Uh, this is pictures from uh, some of the roadways, cars stranded, obviously impassable roads. You can see the lower left picture there. Uh, the wind piles that snow up four, five, six feet deep. Uh, pretty much shuts everything down for a, a good amount of time. Of course, the picture you see on the Weather Channel is in town, and you really don't get the full effect of what's happening out in the country. But just like town, the people out in the country are digging out, trying to find uh, the best way to uh, get access to the things they need to get access to, whether that's down the highway or it could be as simple as just digging a path to the barn. And uh, in western South Dakota, when the snow blows in like that, it'll blow everywhere. So a lot of times it takes a tractor just to get out of the house to the barn. So while the infrastructure is what I called it, the city and the county and things like that were responding to the greater good and public safety, trying to clear roads, clear things in, the, in town, trying to rescue, on the bottom two pictures, we have snowmobiles, they were out rescuing stranded motorists. They uh, had some hunters out in the hills that were up there for deer or elk season. They got caught in the storm, so they had to go up with snowmobiles and try to find them and get them out. Storm with that much wind and that much moisture also wreaks havoc on the utilities. There was large areas of western South Dakota that was out without uh, electric power. They actually called in the National Guard to help uh, establish uh, electricity to a lot of the state, and even with their help, uh, there was people out of power for 14 days. And most people were out of power between two and four days. So cities, counties, they were all involved trying to help the greater public safety, and the ranchers were out there on their own, uh, mainly because the people from the city couldn't get to them. So... When the snow stopped and the sun shined, the rancher's first priority was to try to find the animals that survived the storm. And that might have included digging them out of the snowbank, as in the top left picture there. Or it might have required getting on horseback and uh, going to look, because where the animals started before the storm, they were no longer in that area. In the bottom right picture, that's downtown Rapid City. They had some visitors. Um, this storm caused cattle to move anywhere from 10 to 12 miles. It was long enough in duration. Um, they, they pretty much uh, headed with the wind and just went until something stopped them. So one of the big things for the ranchers was to, to find out what, what animals survived and where they were at. What the wind did do, as you can see in the top right picture, was it did blow some, uh, some of the hills clear which was good because the livestock, after enduring 48 to 60 hours of storm and traveling 10 to 12 miles, really wasn't fit to be driven those 10 to 12 miles back home. 
So a lot of what happened was the ranchers would round them up or, or find them, drive them to a top of a hill where they could uh, re rest and recuperate. They could get some hay or something to them and give them some time because that's really what the animals that survived the storm needed was time to recover. Uh, they, were, they were in pretty bad shape. So as I said before, it's not unusual for South Dakota to get major storms and, and blizzards, and we certainly have people that are prepared for that. But in this case, there were several circumstances that made it a lot worse than normal and went from something with, that looked uh, a lot like the picture on the right where cattle are out, and as I said, the grass was good, so they, were, they had it pretty good until three days later looking a lot like some, some of the cattle looked on the left. One thing about the picture on the right, you'll notice those first two animals there. One's a cow and one's a calf. Um, it's late in the year. South Dakota, they use, uh, ranchers usually calve between March and May. And then weaning time is typically October. So most of these calves were, were, uh, ready to be weaned. Nearly, uh, probably at peak demand on the cows. The cows were still trying to feed them. So a lot of the cows that were out there, even though the grass was good, they were probably in a negative energy balance. Um, because it had been 80 degrees and nice for the last three or four weeks before this, uh, they didn't have their winter coats. And without that thick winter coat to protect them, the driving rain and the 40 to 50 mile an hour wind uh, pretty much soaked them right to the skin. They didn't have a lot of their natural protective uh, equipment on yet, I guess. And uh, that certainly contributed to the fact that the animals didn't survive as well as, as they might have later in the year. They were on summer, summer pasture for the most part. And in western South Dakota, summer pasture is not a lot different than winter pasture, although winter pasture will typically be a little rougher, have a few more hills, maybe have some shelter belts planted and a little bit more protection. Um, and closer to home. And that's one thing the ranchers really didn't have time to do with the late forecast four or five days before the storm hit. They really didn't have time to, to do anything with, with the animals that were a long ways from home. They may have been on summer range 10 miles away, maybe 40 miles away from home. So they really didn't have time to get them home. And it probably wouldn't have made any difference if they did because animals that were up close or animals that... Uh, that were moved to uh, what the ranchers thought was better protection and better pasture didn't fare any better than the other ones. They still migrated with the storm and, and they still had a lot of death loss. And then one other thing with the 80 mile an hour or 80 degree temperatures was uh, the ground wasn't frozen and that really um, contributed to the animals and, uh, and the death loss I think is just that the, the ground was not frozen in the first two inches of uh, rain in western South Dakota, that makes mud, and that makes really sticky, deep mud that's hard to navigate. The animals themselves died from numerous causes and probably a combination of causes. Hypothermia, certainly, from uh, the lack of the hair coat and the cold rain and moisture. As I said, they, they uh, traveled extensively. Some of them traveled until they just fell down just dropped from exhaustion. Uh, some animals found protection, but not enough protection for the amount of animals that were in the herd, so there was some trampling and things like that. There was large groups of animals that, as they traveled with the poor visibility, uh, walked into stock ponds and, uh, and lakes and things like that and drowned. Some of them did find protection, but the snow came over the, the hill or over the trees and covered them and they suffocated. So numerous causes of, of death. Our uh, animal industry board, our agency, set up a voluntary reporting system for producers to call in. We had about 300 producers call in and report about 22,000 cattle, uh, 1,400 sheep, some horses, and even some buffalo. And it's pretty bad when the buffalo can't survive a blizzard. They're pretty hardy animals, and if it kills them, you know it's bad. Um, this was a voluntary effort, uh, voluntary accounting. There was no uh, monetary reimbursement tied to this accounting or anything like that. We know that that is not a true estimate of the animals that perished 
or the producers involved. Uh, South Dakota, Western South Dakota ranchers are uh, a uh, stubborn, proud group. And some of them just plain didn't want to admit to uh, losing animals under their care. They took it hard. Um, nothing they could do, but, but they beat themselves up sometimes about it. The Rancher Relief Fund, which was set up uh, by several organizations, um, some of the, the beef and sheep and, and different producer organizations set that up and worked cooperatively. They did have some money to disperse, and so they had uh, reports of 43,000 head, which is probably obviously a closer number, but I still don't think that was the total number of animals that perished. I don't think anybody knows that. I personally know of ranchers who lost animals, and uh, I talked to them numerous times and asked them if they'd reported it, and they simply said they weren't going to. And they said, my neighbor lost a lot more than I did. My handful or my 40 or whatever isn't, isn't that big a deal. And that was a, a, common, uh, a common thought process, I guess. So we know it's at least 43,000. So at the state level, our involvement, um, one of the first things that happened was Civil Air Patrol put up flights over western South Dakota trying to determine uh, where animals were, where live animals were, where carcasses were, uh, the extent of, of uh, the problems and the involvement of the area that was uh, covered and, and uh, affected. Our agency provided technical support and guidance to counties and producers that were calling us and asking what to do. Uh, both on the live animal and the, and the animals that perished. Um, care of the live animals obviously was first for everybody and then, and then trying to deal with the carcasses. And then the governor suspended a couple regulations. Uh, we have a, a rule in our state that says that uh, carcasses need to be disposed of within 36 hours by burning, burying, or rendering. Obviously, in an event like this, it's impossible to meet that 36-hour requirement, so that, that uh, rule is officially suspended as well as uh, removing the uh, weight limits on the uh, rural roads and things like that so that uh, trucks could haul carcasses, uh, rendering trucks and other, other large trucks could haul and move carcasses to get them to places they needed to be without worrying about weight restrictions. Some pictures here of uh, the aftermath. The top right picture, obviously, I, I saw dozens and dozens of pictures like this, uh, animals that got to the backside of the, of the cliff there and, and tried to get out of the storm, and there was just too many animals for the space that was provided for them. That's obviously two or three days later. One thing about this storm, the sun came out and it melted very fast. The, the snow started leaving, and, and of course there it turns to mud. But um, some sheep there. The bottom right uh, picture is a... a trench that somebody dug and uh, put the carcasses in. Of course, then the snow melts and, and fills it up. They probably didn't uh, have all their carcasses accumulated to cover it up yet, so then that made it kind of a muddy mess. As, uh, as our agency, we, uh, we were involved with uh, re a carcass recovery uh, along the state highways and in the right-of-ways, the ditches, anything from the fence lines to the to the highway, we were responsible for coordinating and picking up those. We worked with two rendering companies to get that accomplished. Um, there was a lot of carcasses in the roadways. That was one of the places the animals could move freely. Once they got out of the pasture they were in, they didn't have cross fences, they just went down roads. Um, it was not unusual for us to have our people drive a, a county or a state highway and uh, they went through in GPS um, carcasses and then passed that along to us, and we coordinated with the rendering trucks to get down those highways. And three or four days later, enough snow would have melted that we had to send the rendering trucks down the same highway to pick up the rest of the carcasses. They'd pick up just as many the second time through that were buried as, as the first time through. Counties themselves obviously worked uh, with their producers, uh, some counties more than others. We uh, actually had a, a carcass disposal meeting in western South Dakota, several of them actually, with different counties just in 2011. And it was not in the natural disaster blizzard uh, realm, but uh, 
foot and mouth disease and what would happen if we had a, a disease outbreak and what the options would be for carcass handling and things like that. Uh, we didn't get the attendance and the buy-in from the counties that we were hoping for. We got several, but not all. And part of that is in western South Dakota, some of those counties very sparsely populated. They just don't have the infrastructure in place. County emergency managers are sometimes uh, volunteers, not paid, uh, doing other things, and uh, just didn't get the uh, see the importance of being there or couldn't didn't have the funds, whatever, to, to attend those meetings. And that showed with the, uh, the county's response in, in this event. And then if the counties couldn't respond, then it was left to the individual producers to, to find a way to deal with the carcasses. We did already have in place guidelines for on-farm carcass disposal. That's uh, uh, under South Dakota law that our Animal Industry Board uh, promulgate rules to handle that, and that uh, document I think you can maybe read it. It's pretty busy, but uh, that's that was in place prior, and it was really a good guideline to be able to have there sent out to uh, whoever was calling and asking for, uh, whether a county or producers calling for advice and things like that. We could just send it right out to them and say, this is what you need to need to work with. And it was previously approved by other state uh, agencies and things like that, so everybody was on the same page. That was very helpful. Carcass management decision cycle for us, uh, if you started at the top right corner, landfilling wasn't an option. They quickly moved down. Rendering in western South Dakota uh, typically is not uh, an option. There's two rendering companies that cover South Dakota, and both of them are on the eastern side of the state where the livestock population is more dense and, and there's more of a call. The western part of the state's just too large for them to run up and down the roads all the time. Uh, moving down quickly passed through incineration and composting and ended up on the bottom left at uh, suitable on-site burial. The counties, as I mentioned, did uh, contribute, at least some of them. Uh, some of the, the counties that had more resources definitely stepped up. They uh, used county equipment and county operators to dig large pits. They uh, and then publicized the location of those pits so that the producers could haul to those pits um, they were open for several days where producers could drop animals off. Uh, I think there was about five pits total in western South Dakota, and I have no idea how many animals they buried in those pits, but it was a large number. Um, county, as I said, equipment and operators also went out and, uh, and helped producers to pick up animals, uh, not only on, on private land, but also on, uh, on the county roadways. And then the, in the counties where the or in yeah in the counties where the counties weren't able to provide the assistance, it was left up to the producers. A lot of them called the rendering companies directly. Some of them called our office and uh, coordinated with us to get the rendering companies there. Uh, some of them dug their own pits. Some of them hired private contractors to dig pits on their property. Some of them begged and borrowed county equipment to dig pits. Um, so the producers really were involved from start to finish as soon as the as soon as the blizzard was over on the top right, uh, gathering up the animals that that they uh, they could find that survived and often that was as uh, as TR mentioned with the the uh, commingling of animals and things like that they, there was herds mixed up and, and they just gathered the animals they could find and sorted it out later as to where they went. And then uh, obviously picking up the carcasses, and then the bottom picture there is a is a pit three or four months afterwards, um, after it was all closed up. You can see that uh, it uh, somebody's out there checking to make sure it was not disturbed. Some more pictures of the event. Um, certainly, I could have had a hundred slides of pictures. Um, top left, uh, producer, private producer, digging a pit on his own ground. Um, very, very typical picture. Animals wandered and, and went with the storm until they hit a fence they couldn't cross or in some cases went through that fence and went to the next one. Uh, the top right is a burial pit where he's in the process of uh, collecting animals. Right down to collecting individual animals on the bottom right. And then the bottom left picture is the rendering company. They had uh, large trucks and this is the way that they collected the animals off of the uh, state highways and roadways 
and then also um, they pull into a producer's place. The inside truck or the top one in that, or left one, I guess, in that picture, you can see him sitting on his grapple fork there, and he would uh, pull up next to the animals and grab them and load the, the truck without the fork, and then he'd load his own truck, and then he'd head back, and they had to drive about 300 miles back to eastern South Dakota in order to process those carcasses. So it was a, it was long hours for those people. They had, uh, I know one company called in some more trucks, and they had about a dozen trucks running. So in the, the recovery effort, uh, many industry groups, as I said, got together and administered the Ranchers Relief Fund. Uh, one thing TR mentioned earlier in his presentation is donations will come in, and it's important to have an outlet for those and, and a place to funnel um, money, uh, equipment, volunteers. Everybody is going to want to help, and you need to be able to to funnel that in the right direction, and the Ranchers Relief Fund did a great job of that. I think they collected around $6 million that they dispersed to South Dakota producers. South Dakota Department of Ag uh, had some low-interest loans available for producers. Uh, NRCS actually came in through their EQIP program and paid for some of the carcass disposal burial costs, uh, some of the fencing costs, some of the shelter belt uh, reconstruction costs and things like that. South Dakota State Extension, very involved in uh, education and helping the producers and dealing with, uh, with carcasses, live animals, different uh, health issues that they ran into later on. And then there was uh, about eight or ten community meetings spread around western South Dakota, which was attended by our agency and, and many other state agencies, uh, producer groups, bankers, insurance agents, things like that, getting together provided a meal for uh, the producers in the area and, a, and really a night to get the producers in the same room and they could talk to each other and, and kind of commiserate, I guess, and uh, just go through what they'd experienced. And, and it, was, it was really odd listening to some of the stories that they told. Um, I heard a hundred of them, but uh, it, was, it was a different kind of storm. There'd be one ranch might have lost 250, 300 cows. And the ranch right next door, same terrain, same kind of animals, might have lost 12. Just un, unknown why, um, you know, both ranches may have had calves on the cows, same type of cows, everything. Just It just really was an odd storm where it didn't seem to have follow any logic. So in summary, uh, most this all happened uh, during a federal government shutdown time, so there wasn't a lot of federal assistance available. At the time, later, 14 counties and two uh, reservations were declared, declared presidential disaster areas. Um, it was an economic uh, blow to western South Dakota. There's no doubt about it. Uh, producers lost a lot of animals that they couldn't replace right away um, because of the really unknown number of uh, animals that perished. We really don't know the, the total extent of that economic uh, hardship, but, but it was substantial. But one of the interesting things that came out of the whole deal was how the neighbors stepped up and helped neighbors. Uh, the Western uh, lifestyle really showed itself. Producers getting together, sharing pits, sharing um, equipment, um, whatever needed to, they needed to do to get the job done for them and, and their neighbors. So what did our agency learn from this? As, as TR said, so you've all heard emergencies are always local. And we did try to communicate with the local authorities in 2011. Um, at the time, we thought we did a good job, but two years later we figured out that maybe we didn't. Um, I mentioned that uh, the volunteers and people wanting to help have an outlet for that. Communication with other agencies, and uh, that kind of goes back to the 2011 meetings. Um, some of the things that we thought would be available and we thought would be there for us and, and for other people were not there when the time came. And I think a lot of these meetings, everybody says, oh, yeah, we'll be there. We can have things available to you. And uh, it's all about priorities. And if the priorities are to move the, move the uh, snow in town to get the hospitals 
back functioning. We had uh, large buildings in, in towns that collapsed under the weight of the snow and things like that. So there was lots of other things pulling at different uh, resources that might have, we might have expected to be available for an ag emergency that, that were diverted. And then face-to-face -face relationships, get out and, and meet with the, the county people and the local people. Um, you always get more done if you know who you're talking to or they, they know who's calling them to ask for help and things like that. Certainly those face-to-face -face relationships are invaluable in, in getting things done in crisis. <laughs>